today of uh, sad now because we've been running for the last 15 days on a daily basis and you know all of a sudden and on 31st for those who are uh, new i just want to just talk a little bit about like uh, about a brand connect middle east and we have some guests from qbart qbart is the people those who did the complete doing this year's uh, contest as well okay so uh, i brand connect uh, photographer then 20 years into here uh, with a distribution company uh, worked as a brand manager for Nikon for eight years it connection between the group of people individuals brands influencers or that is the that is the all concept uh, so initial days was and got some uh, you know brands like HNW filters in the accessories for plenty of uh, you know devices and then then tour box that's the editing console and by CNN, they make special request from some of the friends saying that you know the last days of Ramadan is going to be kind of challenging for them for for someone who is fasting, uh, having some special prayers and kind of thing. Then we thought, okay, let us do this time twenty days. Now these twenty days again, you know, we always look into uh, who is doing these events. I mean, so who is that mentor who is going to be here in the platform? So this year, uh, we are doing this 20 days event with the support of 13 nationalities. 13 nationalities uh, are doing this 20 days of event. Okay. Uh, in total, like out of this 216 events, uh, it has been done with the support of almost around 112 individuals. And these 112 individuals are from 30, 30 nationalities. So our aim is not focus only on a certain community. Our aim is to completely look into the entire globe. So because of that, you know, wherever we are, like for example, exposure, global media congress, world at Dubai, uh, Expo Kalnair, uh, Taste of Dubai, Taste of Abu Dhabi, all these areas we participate. Um, throughout the year, we'll be having some or other kind of activities other than the events uh, as such so the the response uh, towards ibrand connect is getting positive um, i'm so happy about that because um, uh, you know it's a 24 7 kind of uh, you know response whenever you want to have certain things like you know our our aim is to just make it happen if we don't have it we try to grab it from some of the other distributors and get it done. Now, I always say price. Many people, uh, com, uh, you, know, of, you know, take things through Amazon, Noon, or online sites. So I always tell them, okay, let me know a screenshot of what exactly that you are getting and the, what the kind of service that you are getting. So if I'm able to match that kind of prices, for sure, I'll be in a position to match the price or even less than that. But the kind of services are something extra, like, you know, many of the photo talks used to be free. Many of the photo talks, even it is charged, it used to be kind of uh, a subsidized charge. Because, for example, like some of the rooftops, we had to pay, I, uh, we were together like uh, Anand and all, we paid 25,000 dirhams for one night to take a picture of the New Year's Eve. 25,000, can you believe that? 25,000 dirhams just for one night to take the New Year's Eve. And the regular scenarios, it is 3,000 3, dirhams sometimes for, and then, you know, we divide between the people, like, and then at the end, you know, like someone comes as a mentor, also we have to support them. So it is something like, you know, like a kind of contribution, which we never think those as a kind of income generating uh, kind of things. And, you know, we just do it. For example, even if the, this Iftar photo talk alone. So we got support from certain brands. And if there are so, brands are not there, we will put our, our own brand as the sponsor brand, irrespective whether they support or not support. Because we want to create this as a regular daily event. So, yeah, so thanks again. And today, we have a very special person, and he is our Leo Photo Ambassador. And he's Anub Manikot. Uh, Anub, uh, is hey, hey, thank you. Great, Anub, yeah. So, Anub, Anub, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so, guys, you can also come outside. It is an amazing session, you know, you'll enjoy. So, 
Anub, Anub did his first session uh, last year. Last year during the iftar only, yeah. right? Iftar. That, that was also during the iftar photo talk. Uh, then he is a great supporter for me, for us. Uh, a, a pure gentleman who uh, pass out pa uh, pass the entire information without any any kind of uh, yeah. So um, thanks that, Anup for all the support. I'll start. Uh, no no no. no okay. <laughs> I know I know. Yeah, because I know you guys are just waiting for how he created these all pictures. I know that, but I'm just boring you. That's kind. <laughs> just <laughs> some more time. Now, maybe maximum another ten minutes I'll take. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, no. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. And, you know, you. We, I, we want to just enjoy you. your talk. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank Keep you, supporting Shaji. us. Thank you, everyone. And Collect. Bye. And thank you, Leo Ford, for having me here. And thanks to all of you for joining me in this session. So, yeah. And thanks to Kair and his her husband so for creating this nice artwork. So, I have moved on and to the new logo, which was created by him. So basically, uh, I'm more concentrated into creating wildlife action shots with end-to-end -end complete details. So I'll begin with, uh, yeah, the first, I have divided into three different sessions. Uh, the first will be wildlife action shots, why I chose action shots and how I do it, and my approach and settings on the field and editing workflow. So the first thing was for me back in 2019 when I started photography was to find something to stick with in photography. So there were so many different opportunities and avenues in Dubai to shoot cityscapes, um, landscapes, wildlife, birds. And then I started clicking everything. So this was uh, somewhere in Rasal Khor. I was trying to shoot birds and then found this and then I shot, yeah, this, I shot people, landscapes, moon, I won uh, the award from uh, Canon for uh, the best uh, moon shot that year in 2019 and for a long time I put uh, in my Instagram handle that award winning wildlife photographer and this was the award and then I now I removed. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think this was the time I actually started liking the details in the picture back in 2019. I tried capturing a lot of subjects, traveled in travel to Oman, Sri Lanka. This was in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, Alkudra, the other one. Um, 2019, I did this trip to Sri Lanka. That's when I saw this bird for the first time in Sri Lanka. I didn't know that I would have a, a complete passion behind this bird back then. I went around and shot this bird for two and a half years until I could get some decent shots. I could not get for two and a half years and then only 2023, end of 2023, I could manage to get some shots. So these were all done with my old Canon 80D camera with coupled with 150-600 uh, Sigma lens. I think this was this image was a change that has brought into my the way I look at uh, the wildlife photography or the bird action photography. This was shot at uh, Burj Khal, uh, sorry, uh, Bar Dubai, uh, the temple area. Uh, there is an area where these fits fly around. They fly in massive speeds. With uh, Canon 80D and then 150-600, it was a three days effort to get one image frozen. This was the only image I got frozen that day, or for the three days that I've tried. And then slowly, slowly, I became better. I started freezing birds, all with the ATD camera again. I understood uh, the importance of going eye level, and then it became entirely different perspective altogether. Yep. And then I understood what is an exposure triangle, because until then, I, almost all my shots were overexposed or underexposed. I didn't know how to 
bring in the proper light into the picture or, or in the image that I was shooting. And then I actually spent, this was the one area where I had spent most of my time in the entire uh, photography journey where I had spent my time to understand if there is anything that is the exposure triangle. So I would urge you guys to go and do your uh, research on uh, exposure triangle if um, most of you guys would be already doing it, but if you haven't done it already, but that's the basics. Um, if you know the exposure triangle, you will be able to play with the light, whichever the way you want. Yeah, learning and knowing the gear, it's very important. Um, everyone talks about that. These are all cliche dialogues in photography, but uh, uh, you will know exactly what your gear can do because you know the camera that you have right now would be capable enough to produce the kind of images that you need. But you always look at someone else who has a better gear thinking that, okay, I my pictures are not sharp enough or good enough because I don't have that gear. But that's most probably that's not the case. I know a friend of mine, a uh, fellow photographer from Kerala, who has a 300mm lens, 70-300mm uh, basic kit lens from uh, Nikon. And he creates amazing images with that. His funda is, his technique is that he goes near. He goes near really close to the subject and capture them with a very basic camera. So it's all about, in case you have some limitations in your gear, you need to understand particularly what exactly is the limitation in your gear so that you can adapt. Most often you will be able to create better images. And then, yes, you, I one thing I stuck is that I always look at inspirational images from uh, most of the creators. Some of them are listed here. Uh, and then you understand the way they create images. Most of them are doing reels about the behind the work, what all works that is that they put in, in creating images or reels. So you can learn a lot of things. So don't hesitate in looking at these kind of, uh, you know, ins inspiring personalities and photographies and then learn from them. And most importantly, right company in photography. So if you have the right company, I mean, I have benefited most with the right kind of people when we were going out for shooting. So it's about being in tandem, especially in wildlife, uh, if you are approaching a subject and then that subject is very shy and the, the group of people do not understand the importance of being silent or quiet or going really completely, you know, on stealth mode, most often you will miss the shots. Plus, uh, the other way around is that the other benefit is that uh, the, ins the knowledge will be shared in between. So a lot of things that I've learned are from my friends, the fellow photographers in Dubai, where we had a great connection and then we exchange. Whatever I know, I teach them, and whatever they know, they teach me. So that was sort of a give and take. So having the right kind of group who supports you, who be with you is very important in wildlife photography. That's what I understood. You can also do it alone, but the learning curve will be much slower when you do it alone. When you go with the group, who are like-minded, uh, the learning curve will be quicker. This is the second part where how I approach the subject and the photography on the field. I always visualize my frames. Uh, I, you know, if I go to a place, automatically the frame that I want to create will come to come into my mind. So the pursuit then is to create that image. So always. If I don't get that, get it on the day, um, first day, I go back the second day, third day, until I get that frame that I want. Uh, so it may not be consecutive days, but anyway, the, the constant trial will be there. So the visualizing the frame, uh, when you are there in the, out there in the field, the wildlife photography is uh, such a genre that uh, you don't have the proper lighting. I mean, you will never have the light that you want. Always you, have, you will have difficulties to get the proper light. So how to utilize that light falling onto the subject? How do you create anticipating the bird's actions or the subject's actions? How do you do that? How do you learn that? There are different ways you, you should learn. I mean, basically, um, when there is a bird sitting perched somewhere, if you know the bird will fly after doing certain uh, actions, then it is easier for you to anticipate. So most often the kingfishers, they shed before they fly from a perch. 
So you know that then you can be ready that, okay, uh, it's going to fly and then your finger will be on the shutter because otherwise carrying the lens and waiting for it to fly will be a long time. But you know that, okay, it's going to fly right after that. But so the learning the behavior of the subject is very important in my life. Otherwise, um, you'll get tired massively. So yeah, this is an image of uh, me visualizing. <coughs> I was in Maharashtra trying to shoot uh, Paradise Flycatcher uh, two years ago. And I saw this squirrels playing on this rock. I knew that at some point it will jump because you know, squirrels, right? They, most often they jump. So I waited for that. I adjusted my camera settings for this particular flight because the light was from behind, uh, behind but from the left side of the frame. And it is a difficult shot to freeze. It, a, it was very far away. Second, because of the light. It's most part of the subject is in the darker side. All these are, um, you know, sort of my visualization, the effects of visualization, because when, they, when these goose are in the water, they normally try to take bath. And after the bath, there is a mandatory fluttering of the wings. So you wait for that. And this was also like quite, it's like uh, the goose is praying to the sun, sort of that feeling. This one, um, for most days, I was trying, I mean, there is a place where in Al Qudra, these birds are in groups. And I was trying to get an image of this kind, just to show what the autofocusing capabilities in my camera. Uh, so basically, the bird has flown from far, and it's coming in. This is the first frame. You can see the eye sharp, even though it has, there are other two eyes, uh, which the camera could easily go and capture, but it's stuck. And then even after that, in a very difficult position, it is focused. Again, this one, if I go on and tell all the stories, there are so many images here. So anticipation because I saw this, these bunch of minas, this is jungle mina. They were playing around in a field in Ras Al Khaimah. We were shooting some other birds and I knew that this bird will fly in this action. I wanted this and I wait for, waited for probably an hour or more to get this image. Very difficult subject to capture in flight, especially when it is flying towards you. Be it a, another very difficult customer when it comes to freezing. All the wing position, it's quite unreal for me as a wildlife photographer to capture it in this position. Uh, I was in this hide in uh, Maharashtra, Tamani Ghat. I think Ifas was there recently. And this bird was there and then I could see that uh, the wasp was flying around. And it was sort of a moment where the bird was asking, how dare you come near me? You knew that and I would just eat you. And it gulped down the next. Similar. This was also uh, sort of the similar experience. Again, in Maharashtra, I was shooting um, the set next year. The, uh, I think it was 2022, end of 2022, I was uh, shooting the Indian Paradise Flycatcher trying to get some frame. I, didn't, I could not get any of that bird in frame in sharp that year. But I saw this uh, particular bird doing this. Again, uh, this image is uh, the effect of preparation. Uh, this is a parrot, the only parrot species in India. A very tiny bird. Um, it's very difficult to capture them in flight because they, once they land on a, a particular millet, it finishes the entire millet and then they would fly. So you cannot anticipate when they will actually fly out from that because it's a long wait. So then after some observation, I could find that the bird from one millet, after it finishes, it goes to the other millet and sometimes it is not ripe enough. And then immediately, when they figured out that it's not ripe enough, they would fly from there. So you would look for the opportunities where it would land on an unripe millet, 
and then you know that you know it will fly away so then this is one of those shots where it flew away from unripe millet similar this is um, siberian stone chat it comes to india every year during the winter uh, normally these guys are very difficult to be frozen in flight very tiny it's um, probably at the size of a sparrow again uh, it was the anticipation because lighting how do you reckon this lighting is is it good lighting bad lighting anyone bad lighting right okay this one good bad <laughs> first okay this one okay so most of what i do is i prefer the sun to be coming right from my back so that the subject is properly exposed so this is one of the example uh, and then you can play with a lot of things so increase your shutter speed what happens you get entirely very dark background so it it's as if i have edited out the background but it's actually as short because i had increased the shutter speed to 6000 so this is the effect of that okay good enough but not so perfect for me a decent lighting the sun was coming right behind me al khudra <laughs> so these kind of lighting uh, the light where you know there is only a spot of light falling onto the subject is where i get excited because you can create dramatic images with such kind of lighting soft but spot lights you can see the light is falling exactly on the eye of the subject another spot light so the golden light uh, one of my most favorite lighting again golden light golden light this in this image the light is coming from the side it's it's perfect lighting because of the action is towards the place where the light is coming in that same direction good lighting or bad lighting bad lighting right side lighting but bad lighting good bad bad for you no actually for me it is a very good lighting because it it enabled me to pull out the details on the entire scene for me uh, the yeah i mean like the light was a bit harsh i think i shot it around 9 o'clock around in mysore that year but still it had helped me to pull out the details in the entire subject another side lighting quite dreamy kind of a lighting perfect lighting yeah babe going eye level of the subject i speak this or uh, whenever somebody asks me about you know how do you get that bokeh in the background i always tell them go to the eye level of the subject but they always think that you know i'm keeping some secret away from them but you know trust me if you go to the eye level of the subject the bokeh is assured like this but for me this is not eye level the eye level is this despite the fact that the next bird is right behind it you got the complete bokeh good one all right so this is eye level so this i was clearly shooting from a moving car uh, not moving car it stopped of, of course for shooting but you can see that the angle of capture is from from top to bottom it is always going to be very difficult for the camera sensor to judge the lighting so what i do on the field is to reduce the effort for the camera sensor so 
when you give a subject isolated and you're shooting at the eye level, you actually help the camera to decide the proper lighting because it only have to judge the lighting from this subject. The background is so far that it doesn't have to worry about how the light is reflecting on from the background. So your subject is going to be extremely sharp. Other settings also should be there, but going eye level and then isolating the subject from the background is the key to get the sharper images on the field. I can't emphasize how important it is, but anyway, next time when you see a subject and you're in the car, and unless it is on your eye level, don't shoot. Just go down, don't worry about the mud, but the effect, the after effect, the, the, the return, of, return of benefit is, you know, it's huge, sharper image. I was almost at the eye level. Eye level, I was lying flat. You can see how good is the background. Again, I was at the eye level. Bad example, I was shooting from top. Eye level. See the difference between it's almost shot at the same place on same days. I mean, I think it is one or two days difference. Uh, so I want to emphasize the kind of lighting we were getting was the similar, almost at the similar hour. But see the difference on the image. You get that, the green background. Here it is only water. The camera is struggling to find out where exactly it needs to look at for uh, getting the proper lighting or, you know, the. It is the, the sensor, All what it always does is it reads the reflected light and then understand how the light is and then gives you the output. Another one. Yep. All short at eye level. Nearer the better and being patient and quiet. I have put them together because these are all, both are interrelated. So if you want sharp images, um, nothing better than going really closer to the subject. So you gotta be completely silent. You shouldn't be, if, you, if, it is a, if it is an owl, it's better you don't wear any perfume on that particular day because they have very good nose. Uh, so they will sense you. Anyway, they will spell you out, but still, you know, lesser trouble. So uh, don't wear flashy clothes, be silent, uh, you know, don't make quick movements, move few steps and then stand for few seconds or maybe a few minutes and then approach again. Uh, I and Ajit most often we crawl, uh, we crawl towards the subject. Uh, we have crawled more than 30, 40 meters uh, for certain of the images. And being patient, patience is a virtue when you're a wildlife photographer, we wait. Uh, you know, my friends ask, you know, how, how did you become a wildlife photographer? Because you're not patient. Uh, so, I don't know, probably on the field. <laughs> I'm, I'm patient enough, but maybe with them, I'm less. And being quiet also is a virtue. I was about, uh, six, seven meters away from this subject because I crawled so long and then I went near. Um, they have good, um, good eyes. I mean, every sense is very sharp for them, the owls. They see you from long distance. So it's always about making the subject comfortable. So when you crawl, stop for a few, few seconds and then again crawl, it doesn't give them it doesn't make them alert. So it gives you all the time in the world to go near, shoot. I had spent more than an hour with this owl until, because it was not moving, so I couldn't shoot anything else. So then I went back. Again, this, uh, so we climbed this mountain in uh, Oman, where these guys come from uh, Southern Hemisphere every year to breed there. Uh, very shy bird, they don't come near. So we were, first one and a half hours, we could not find them in proper photographable, photographable spots. 
of the mountain. We tried looking around. We again, Ajit and again, uh, Ajit and me was there in that, in that particular day. We walked around and we found out a place where they would fly low. But again, whenever we were going closer, they were flying away. But we sat there for like good 15, 20 minutes until they come near, and then we shot this. This one, uh, very shy bird. Um, Similar method, I was lying down um, so that the bird could come. Uh, after one hour wait, they slowly came near. Similar experiences. See, if you want to practice a subject which uh, for which you want to go near, this is an ideal subject. All the parks, you can see them. Uh, they are not really worried about the people most of the times, unless you are too close to the subject. So go d down on your belly and then, uh, you know, reach towards the bird, it, they will stay. It will give you nice images. Again, I was very close. Very difficult customer to shoot in flight, but yep, going close always pays off. Um, in my photography journey, what I always did is that I always challenged the status quo. So I wanted to do something different from the rest of the group. It came automatically to me. I don't know when I have decided that it came. So I always challenged the normal norms of uh, wildlife photography for myself just to quench the guy who is inside me. So. I started clicking the action shots. So the end-to-end -end sharpness in an image, in the frame, was what it mattered to me. So I always tried for that. I'll show you some of those images. This was a different experience altogether. This is not about sharpness, but it was about a different frame that I created. Um, 2023, earlier, I mean, the beginning of the year, I was in this place in Maharashtra trying to shoot this bird. This is one of the three images that was only came out sharp because it was such a difficult subject to shoot. Again, uh, normally 90% of the images that I show on uh, see on the field is on with the uh, fellow photographers is the one which is perched down on the ground, and I wanted to click something different, so I try for that. This one, uh, I was in Georgia with my friends. They actually had to drop me at this place and they went around and then so full half day trip and came back and even then I, was, I wasn't done shooting this. Uh, quite a dreamy lighting here and it's not so easy always to shoot a bird flying towards you. It was pretty close to get all the details in one frame. Mantakini, most of you guys know. I call her Mantakini. This is common kingfisher. Um, I went to a place in uh, Kerala in India, uh, spent three days shooting this bird, just this bird. Yep. Common subject, most often we wouldn't look at opportunities to shoot a bird, a common bird like this in um, you know having these kind of actions. So with any subject, you can create uh, great images. So even if it is a dove, you can, every different time, I mean, every single time it gives you one or the other different frame for you to shoot. So even if it is summer, you should go out and shoot. I mean, if you are interested in action photography with details, otherwise you, you should travel for, uh, you know, creating images in summer here. Yeah, this is earlier this year. I think, yeah, this is earlier this year, right? It was in January in Kerala. Paradise Flycatcher, after two and a half years of struggle, I could finally capture them. This is another image where I'm really proud of capturing. Uh, tiny fish babies flying, I mean, it's not flying, I mean, slightly. They, they were only jumping for probably this height. 
and it was very difficult to predict when they would jump. So it was sort of an achievement for me to capture. This was algae in the background in the wetland, this image. Uh, so I tried capturing in the morning light, so the background became really orangey. Uh, I started falling in love with uh, these kind of uh, backlit images with details recently. Uh, one, uh, how I could pull this off, because I understood my camera, what the capability of the camera is. I mean, actually it can deliver this. Uh, so while the light is coming from behind the subject, most often you will get only a silhouette of the subject. So pulling the details out from a backlit image is, subject is very difficult. Uh, but you can do it with a little bit of understanding. So exposure, understanding the exposure triangle and the understanding the gear that had helped me to capture this image. Again, paradise flycatcher male, that the one which you have seen earlier was the female. Yeah. Action shot during the sunrise when the light is really low. this image as well. Spent quite, uh, I think, a couple of hours to get this moment because, you know, you can see it is the beak is just touching the water. It hasn't gone inside or it is not up. The same day I was, I have, you have seen the previous images, the same bird. And at one point it heard uh, another uh, kingfisher from behind me. And they are pretty territorial, so they, it just darted towards that. It just flew above my head. So my settings, so basically I shoot only manual. I don't do shutter priority or uh, any other priority, just manual, so I set everything in the camera manually. Shutter speed, again, uh, normally you have motion blur when you go with the lower shutter speed, but the subject, if the subject is not moving, you will get, even if you have low light, you can reduce the shutter speed, you can get better lighting. To me, I try to use the lowest ISO possible, but even, in, even then nowadays, the modern day cameras, even if you go around 1000 ISO, it is not a problem. You can denoise it anyway. There are third-party denoising softwares available. So somewhere nearby 1000 is where I normally play depending on the light. But I will try, always try to keep my ISO the lowest possible. This image, can you guys guess what is the shutter speed I shot with? Somebody? No, it was actually 250. So the bird would come and sit there on this perch for, it is obviously a hide, so it would come and uh, sit there before it flies to the, uh, its um, nest. So it's bringing food for its chicks, basically. So for a f split second, it was raining that day, you can see the water all over. Raining that day, it is in a very, you know, dense jungle, uh, so, the light was almost nothing. So I had to reduce my shutter speed so low that I could get the subject in proper exposure. So that's why. So normally we have a perception that when you reduce the shutter speed, you get motion blur. But uh, if you understand the theory behind it, the exposure triangle rightly, you can create images in low light also, provided the subject is not moving for even when there is motion blur, you can create, uh, you know, creative images, but that's a different choice. But for me, if it has to be sharp, then I, ha I had to, you know, adopt different methods. Another, this is also shot on an overcast day. Um, you can see the, the wings. It was shot at uh, around 500 shutter speed. Can you guess the shutter speed here? Yeah? You are not you, somebody else.
1 by 15th of a second. So to get that, you know, the, the effect. Of course, this is my favorite shutter speed to go to. Um, if the light is good, my shutter speed is almost 90% of the time stuck to 1 by 3200 of a second. These are all shot at the same shutter speed. So I'm putting aperture ISO and yeah, I should always row. Um, row, why row? I don't know if anybody is shooting JPEG these days, but why row? Uh, row gives you possibilities to edit everything in the picture, the color, everything. You can actually change the image from top to bottom to an entirely different one. JPEG, it's a, actually a processed image from your camera. So whatever the settings that you keep for uh, picture, that's the output that you're getting. Very minimal adjustments that you can do in a JPEG when it is coming out of the camera. Aperture, I normally find uh, two sp uh, sports above your minimum uh, aperture, minimum value of aperture, always work. Like if it is a f6.3 lens, f8 will give you a sharper image. f4 minus f4 lens, it will give you around f5, f5.6 gives you a sharper image. And ISO, as I already explained, I adjust my uh, adjust um, ISO manually uh, according to the exposure in the field. So I keep it low. You can pull out, I mean, so the basic principle in wildlife is that when it is a darker subject, increase your ISO or exposure high. Uh, if, if white is the more prominent color on a subject, reduce your ISO so that you don't overkill it. Coming there. White balance. So if the light is good and then I'm not trying to create a, uh, you know, any different effect, I'm always, uh, I ask the camera to disable the cam uh, white balance. So I always put it in auto. Morning, I go closer to 10,000 Kelvin. I adjust my uh, Kelvin manually, which you can do in your camera white balance, so that you get that golden uh, golden light effect. So this image, oh, this is shot in at the same time. I mean, almost at the same time. So at different Kelvins. So you can see the difference. So. Even if you need to bring in a different color profile to the, profi uh, the picture the, in the same setting, you can actually change your Kelvin and then achieve that manually. <laughs> See the kind of dramatic effect from left to right. It ring. So um, whenever the uh, mirrorless camera has come in, the metering is not anymore a huge subject that you need to tackle, huge thing that you need, settings that you need to tackle. So I always keep, and since I'm using Sony, I always keep it in multi, multi. metrics for Nikon, I would recommend, and then evaluate to for Canon. Uh, so basically the metering is, in the mirrorless cameras, metering is done differently than the DSLR. DSLR is very difficult. You need to have a complete understanding about the how the metering works, but in modern day cameras, it is not required. So I don't sweat so much of time in there. I normally put in multi, unless there is a special small subject uh, and then I want, the, and the background is extremely lit or brighter than my subject, I would go for sport. In that particular uh, setting, in the metering, what happens is that the light is focused, the sensor will only focus on the sport where you have kept the sport in the metering. So the light will be processed on that sport. So most often I put it in evaluative or the multi. Frame per second is extremely important for my kind of photography because more frames, more action. So if the bird is fluttering its wings, I think in according to the birds, so if it is a smaller bird, it flutters, three to four times in one second, bigger bird at least one or two times in a second. So in my camera, which is Sony Alpha 1, 
it gives an output of 30 frames per second. So I get in one click minimum 30 frames to deal with. So the keeper rates are higher, your success rate is higher. Now Sony has just launched a camera with 120 frames per second. Resolution and all these four things I'm putting together. So resolution, um, since I crop a lot, I use a high resolution camera. Sony Alpha 1 is having 50 megapixel. Z9 is having, uh, Nikon Z9 is having 45. So higher the megapixel, you will not have to go closer to the subject. So that's one benefit. So even if the subject is, subject is little far away, you can crop a lot. So the priority that you set in the AFC, uh, autofocus continuous, should always be at release. So out of, if you put an AF, what happens is that the camera will wait for the subject to be actually in focus, and then only the shutter will go fire. If you put in balance emphasis, camera will take more time because it's gonna evaluate whether I'm doing it right or wrong. But if you put in release, it will fire no matter whether the subject is in focus or not. So modern, modern day cameras, it will anyway, you will anyway get the focus. So why to confuse the camera with uh, you know, additional settings? So go ahead with release in both. AF tracking sensitivity should be five, responsive. All other, so the lesser the number, it waits for the focus to be locked down to the subject before it start tracking. Here in responsive, the moment you press the shutter, it will start tracking. So that's the difference. Finally came the last stage. This is the editing workflow. I believe in 80-20 rule where I create 80% of the image in on the field so that you only have to edit 20% of the field. Um, no problem or uh, there is no issue in editing massively and then changing your entire uh, subject like what Shas Cheng does. Uh, but that's a different genre where I don't want to go personally. So I believe in editing less so that uh, my happiness is in capturing the image sharp at the field. Um, so I always avoid the temptation to overkill in editing. I used to be a massive editor earlier, um, multiple uh, layers and everything, but I slowly had learned that, you know, it's a time-taking process. One image will take minimum hour, hour and a half to edit in the layering method, but now I take less than 10 minutes to edit a picture. I use Adobe Bridge, Camera Raw, Photoshop, and Topaz Denoise AI. I think I can walk you through some of the editing. I asked a couple of uh, friends to give their raw files as well. I'll edit mine first. You select the picture that you want me to edit, and then I'll also edit two of their pictures. Any questions? You guys are utterly silent. I had cut a deal with almost everybody to ask me questions so that, you know, I am never a public speaker. So if you guys ask me, that will make me more comfortable. So please do if you have questions. I think so. So for viewing my files, I normally use uh, Adobe Bridge, which is a view only a viewer software from Adobe. So I personally don't prefer Lightroom because it consumes a lot of memory in the... <laughs> She's going all guns placing. <laughs> So I personally don't prefer because it consumes a lot of uh, internal memory in the computer because it creates a lot of, uh, it consumes while processing as well as to keep the workflow in the computer. Adobe Bridge, it doesn't keep anything. You can, uh, so it also purges out all the images that you have created there automatically. So my computer is always lightweight. And plus, uh, it's been a while I'm using, so I'm completely comfortable with it. So I normally, uh, you know, save my files on a, what is that? 
files on SSD. So these are fast, even if it is kept ex externally. I don't normally keep a lot of files in my laptop, the place where I edit, uh, because more memory being consumed by the laptop, the lesser the speed is when you're editing. So uh, very minimal files will be kept in my laptop. Uh, everything is kept externally. I have a network access system as well, a NAS drive from Synology where I keep uh, files because um, the output, the file size from my uh, camera is about 55, 56 MB per picture. So I shoot a lot and then that fills up all my, I have about eight uh, external hard disk SSDs. So, and then I decided that I would buy a uh, NAS system, network access system, so that to store the files effectively. Even when I'm traveling, I can access it from, it is sitting at my home, it works as a cloud, I can access it. So there are some images that I've taken. I just shortlisted. So you guys tell me which image you want me to sh edit. This one. Okay. This is Kerala. This is Kerala, Payanur. I told you, Alkudra. <laughs> Ajit is the guy to go for when it comes to. I don't know. Uh, Photoshop is behaving a little different now. So yeah, when you open a RAW file in Adobe Photoshop, it opens directly in Adobe Camera RAW. So this is where most of my editing happens. So I would just zoom in and check. Still not bright enough, you know. Okay. So I would just zoom in and check whether all parts are exposed properly, if I need to you know, help increase the light and elsewhere. So I would just try, normally, you know, a little bit of shadows I will increase and then see, yeah, it worked well. I think the light, the eye is properly exposed now. Uh, the white, the white area is a little overexposed. So I would just reduce the exposure a little bit over there. Black, probably I'll increase a little bit. One thing I do is, um, in most of, most part of the world, you have a lot of haze, either in the form of dust or, uh, you know, some other form. So I always would dehaze. So, so I would keep it around 10. Not audible, can you keep it louder? Or the mic is not working. I think it is not connected. It's... Okay, I changed the direction now. Yeah. So dehaze. This is uh, yeah, three thousand two hundred. So the dehaze when you overdo it, it changes the image a lot. So I normally stick around ten, so that it takes away the haze in the right amount, and it doesn't overkill. And I go ahead and then change the optics or the profile corrections. You would have noticed that I haven't changed the contrast yet because I change the contrast normally after it is taken into the Photoshop and denoising is done. I think it is ready for opening in Photoshop. I'll just open it. And then now I will do the cropping. So um, since most of my images are for social media, I love putting it in the square. 
because Instagram doesn't like anything else or four is to five you can hear hear me yeah. okay maybe a little wider there are multiple ways you can crop um, there is rule of uh, third and everything but I normally don't abide any of the rules I just create my own uh, cropping however it pleases me I mean I ju I'm just trying to communicate with my viewers about how I have perceived that image so yeah cropping probably a little bit more tight and then what I would do is that I would go and then run the top pass denoise which takes away the noise so in case you guys are using top pass uh, one rule of thumb that I follow is that the noise I keep it around 10 unless it is taken in extremely low light and you have a lot of noise in the picture this is a relatively unusable picture so I would keep it around 11 or 10 or 11 because I don't want to over sharpen the image or sorry what it does is that it takes away the details of the image it it, it so the noise when you reduce the noise it takes away the details so I would keep it to the minimum possible so that the background noise is gone the subject is almost sharp once that is done what I do is that I'll go to the filter and then pull the camera row filter back again and then the first thing that I would do is that I would increase the contrast a little bit more I, I normally go to the maximum possible uh, contrast after uh, the denoising is done and then a little bit more shadows so that there is a little bit more light and probably I think a bit of dehazing more will bring a little bit of dramatic color into this now I will go for a color mixer I'll pick this tool this decides where the in different spots of the image what color is and then you can just keep it so this is more of yellow and red you can see the sliders moving and here we have a little bit of blue in the eye so I'm going to increase that and probably manually I would just pull this so that so this is actually a replica of Lightroom all these things are there in Lightroom it's just uh, the Photoshop's way of uh, putting Lightroom into it it's called a camera row filter and then sometimes I play with the luminance so since this blue is actually in the darker area of the subject so I want to pull the blue out what I'm going to do is luminance so th when the luminance is increased the light the, the, that particular light will be lumin more luminant in the image so you can see that it is it's more luminant it's more visible probably it's color mixer back right? yeah so that's done so that's my final image actually I'll just put my logo and then export it as uh, JPEG for my uh, you know posting that's it so that's how I do my editing uh, most people would be thinking that it's very minimal but uh, that's what you that's all you need when you are going with the 80 20 rule so you don't spend a lot of time be behind editing so that you can finish your image on the field 90% of the time and uh, I'll pull some widgets image he was kind enough to give me an image so this one 
After connecting this to the screen, the computer is behaving entirely different. Let's note the image. So there is something called masking here. So what I do is that since the eye part of the subject is in the darker area, I may I want <coughs> the eye to be a little bit more prominent in the picture. So what I'm going to do is that I will use the brush tool to select the eye. And then go down and then increase the exposure a little bit, a little bit of shadows, and then saturation a bit high, temperature as well. And then there is this tool, the curve, where you can pick the first one or basically RGB and then the exposure. You can see this, you can select each one of them. If there is more blue in the subject, if you want the blue to be more prominent, you can use that if it is red or green in the background, it only changes that particular color. Sorry, it was not supposed to be blue. Look here and then pull this. So for me, the highlight, the most part of the subject is a little overexposed. So I will reduce the highlight a little bit. You can see the difference. Increase the shadows a little bit. Probably white a little lesser. Go to effect and then increase the dehaze. And then lastly, it's already selected. And then I prefer a 4 is to 5 ratio for this subject. Going and doing the denoise. So this is why I was telling you, that you can actually go really high on your ISO nowadays with the modern day cameras. The, we have tools like Topaz Denoise, even there is an inbuilt denoising in uh, Photoshop and Lightroom as well. You can use them. So yeah, it depends on the lighting. There is no rule of that kind. I could see some of the guys shooting with 12,000 ISO still managing uh, by using denoising softwares. Even 64,000 ISO also, also I shot an image uh, in completely pitch dark at 64,000 ISO. Not little owl. That was, sh that was the video. <laughs> it's again another owl. It was a Indian eagle owl shot in India. <laughs> The Indian eagle owl. That's why I specifically said. I'm a local So I would just increase the contrast a little bit and then check. Yeah, it's working well. Shadows maybe a little bit more. A bit more contrast. I'll go to the color mixer.
So this would be my final output. Uh, sometimes, but most of the time what happens is that it increases your time in editing. So you will have to go and un unselect a lot of the parts all by yourself. Uh, so if you trust on the software, what happens is that uh, it selects unwanted areas and then when the final outcome will be very ugly. So the effort is to reduce the time in the editing so that I'm very lazy sitting in front of the computer. I actually finished the, uh, this presentation today at 4.30. So, yeah, uh, because I'm very lazy. Okay. I think, um, you know, with minimal if editing also you can achieve the kind of quality that you want, just that you have the right kind of techniques in your photography. <laughs> with the right kind of techniques you can reduce your time in the editing on the field you uh, you know concentrate on going really on the low angle using the right shutter speed right ISO that means right. Of your yeah of course you can actually turn this picture completely different actually in editing you can keep this white dots around, I mean the rounds around, the, all the green area can be completely dark and the subject also can be in a different color tone. I have seen people doing that. Can, can you give the right bouquet of maybe making it look like sunset? Yeah, with a lot of effort. I can cut this subject out from this image, keep it separate, get a orange background in the back or you can change the color of this background to orange. Yeah. Uh, there have been cases where uh, we often come across some images shot in Kudra with uh, red leaves. And then uh, we were discussing, you know, where exactly in Kudra is red leaves. But again, that's the creator's freedom, basically. I don't blame them. It's not. Uh, like Shah's Jung creates, you know, that's he goes to the extreme possible where um, the lion has a butterfly sitting on its nose and you know, a lot of very um, dreamy scapes that he creates. Of course, yeah. But that's something that he enjoys doing. I don't enjoy doing. The reason why I get up, if possible, I would go every day out in the morning, waking up at four o'clock or three o'clock and then shoot but I, I don't have the liberty because someone else is paying me to do some other job, so I need to do that. Otherwise I would have gone because, mainly because my drive is into this, creating, finishing the images 80% on the field, so that, you know, that just gets me out of the bed. I'm not normally a morning person, but uh, when it comes to photography, I'm ready to get out. Eva also was kind enough to give me some images. I will try to edit one of them. Uh, yeah, probably the same hide he had been also. The, was it in? It's in Maharashtra, right? Panvel, yeah. Panvel, you have approximately 36 Okay. I'll show you the subject selection. How does it work? See, this is what it happens. So you spend around a lot of time to clear that out. So you can actually subtract by brush and then paint this out. But how long you want to spend behind that? Rather do it right on the field. But still to certain, something that you, it is there in your control, like, you know, now the brushing in certain areas of the image to pull out the light, that you can do, like here.
bit of temperature there. I think that worked pretty well. For me, the white part is a little overexposed, so I will reduce a little bit of highlight. I'll increase the shadow. White's a little lesser. As always, thank you. And then, the haze. I think it's a good candidate of the same crop. Or maybe square works better than this. So that we have a little bit room. So even if some part of the subject is a little dark and if you want to pull a little bit of light out of that, you can use luminance there for doing that. So you can bring this. So remember you select this one so that you get uh, you know, the liberty to go there and then select the color automatically and then just pull it so that the light increase a little bit. It also changes the color a little bit when you increase the luminance, but don't overkill it, that's it. So if you go here, it's an overkill. So if you keep it here, it's okay. In this image, the biggest star, is there any color? Which one, this one? Yeah. You can select it and then pull the color out. I will show you how it can be done. So the reason why I'm reducing the green's luminance is when it is bright, normally the more uh, attention is going towards the background. So when you keep it a little dark, the subject is more in, uh, you know, your eye immediately goes to the subject. So the masking works here if you want to pull. So a little bit of uh, mouse handling as required, like you need to have a very good hands with the mouse so you can select it like this so when you are using the brush always use uh, select the auto mask option uh, this one because auto mask uh, the computer or the software automatically differentiates between the two color tones so that it tries to stick with the same color tone that you're choosing. Otherwise, if you don't select that, the it will select both. And then it is better, but it doesn't mean that it will always stick with uh, the same one. So now maybe you can increase the exposure a little bit. shadows and then if you go in the luminance and then pull this blue out okay that's how you do it final picture any questions about editing
I think it's well past nine and then let's try to close the session. Um, you have a lot of pictures that the birds fly towards you. Hmm. <coughs> How do you manage them? Most of the time the bird must be flying. Yeah, see, that is one of the most difficult shots to obtain in wildlife photography. One, the subject is coming straight to you, especially when it is small. One, uh, focus locking is very important. So when you need to be prepared, again, understanding the bird's behavior, when it is going to fly, it's all about that. So once your focus is locked, but you're not sure when it is going to fly, you cannot keep your finger all the time over there. But you know, after a few days you spend with few days, I'm talking about few days, when you really want to capture a subject and actually this is where the visualization also work, right? You know, like that particular small bird, the blue one, which was flying towards me, I always wanted that click. And what was it? Uh, probably that, that pillar in me, that white pillar. So yeah. So anticipation helps a lot so that you are ready for that moment. Almost all the modern cameras can focus that. But it's all about that extra bit. X factor is your ability to sense when it is going to fly. <laughs> if, are you happy with the edit? Yeah. Or you would have done differently? I, would, I tried differently. I selected the subjects. Took a lot of my time, and not just the exposure of the subject and background and the subject exposure, I increased it, and uh, the background, like the exposure, I increased it. Okay. But it's killing. <coughs> yeah. So uh, when you're trying to unselect, uh, one easy method is to go really closer. Like, you zoom it up, so that you can see that uh, the part where the red overlaps the subject and goes to the background. It's mostly like, you know, particles. Yeah. So if you go closer, it's easy to unselect. So that's one way of doing it. And the top pass area, it's better to use along with Photoshop, right? No, it is there in Lightroom also. Yeah, you can keep it as a plugin. Yeah, but I have top pass area, but now for the, my camera, it's not supported. Okay. Uh, I think the, uh, Which one is your camera? Topaz say I know not. You bought N93. Congratulations. I contacted You also need NAS. I mean, uh, more memory. You know, it's uh, along with that, I got an N60 GB. No, no, I'm talking about the storage. storage. One click, 120 pictures. No, you I'm not, not exposed to say. I set it around, say, there are three options. Uh, one is 10, other one is 50. Okay, this three you should, I actually I'm currently testing it out. Sony gave me one, and then it's an amazing camera. It's fantastic. And the one thing drawback and see that Sony Yeah, that's why I will not buy that because I crop a lot, so it doesn't work for me. But um, still, the image quality is much better. Focusing is amazing. It's Plus, uh, yeah, since last speed. Two weeks only, I'm, I'm before I use it to have a SM4. Still having that one, but I'm using for micro. Okay. Yes. You two are supposed to ask me a lot of questions. You are the only two who are not asking me questions. The one in the white and the lady sitting next. <laughs> You guys. Uh, we are just being very kind. Yeah. This is not being kind. Asking questions. One question. Yeah. Uh, so I think recently you changed it from a zoom lens to a prime lens. Yeah. So we can find any the big difference with that. In terms of clarity, I mean. Uh, of course, uh, 50, 60,000 lens and 5,000 lens. There should be. Because much better glass, mirror, I mean, you know, everything, it's, so, one thing is, so, in uh, uh, the 200-600 or the zoom lens, when the subject is sharp until, say, 25-30 meters, it gives you 
more 20 30 meters so even if it is at 60 meters away the sharpness is much better it grabs the focusing faster than uh, the light zoom light. lens light predominantly light so probably i think the uh, the backlit with uh, subject properly exposed at the front is the effect of uh, having a prime lens. Is it because of that better approach? Yeah, better approach. Also, the way it uh, handles the light. Uh, so, all the modern lenses have um, individual sensor in the lens as well, not only on the camera. So, basically, they communicate. So, more money better sensor in the lens as well as in the camera. Uh, it's a commonly used word in wildlife photography. What do you really mean ethics in photography in wildlife? And as how do you... It very vaguely touches uh, my the topic of the discussion, but... Uh, see, I know... Uh, uh, conservation photographer here, very close friend of mine. So, when he went into the conservation, he felt that, oh, okay, that's a different genre where the animals are handled with respect and everything. Actually, the naturalist, probably in this part of the world, handles the subjects in the worst possible way. He was explaining me in multiple verses. So, just to get a shot. So they handle them from their natural habits, they take it to the studio kind of settings and then shoot and then put it back or sometimes they don't put it back. Several things, Let, let's not talk about it. And um, most often, see, the, the people call themselves ethical photographers and when you look at their photos, you can see that situations where they have gone in and then shot at certain places where the animals are handled, like especially the uh, the snakes in Munnar and some part of India. Uh, they're all handled. Uh, no one shoots in the wild because it's very difficult to find, first of all. Even if they are found in the wild, they will be handled, kept on a tree or something for that you can shoot and then they keep it back. So it's always a thin line between ethical and then... Yeah. How do you define creative photography in how do you define creative photography and why In every photography, you can do the creative side. I mean, like, uh, for example, Ajit, he, though he shoots actions, but uh, the predominant focus that he has is creating a different uh, frame altogether. It could be in terms of lighting, keeping subject at one side of the image or, or something. So creative is in every genre, you can produce creative images. So there is nothing different, right? Photograph. What is different brands? The all now there are different brands of cameras and all of the mirrorless cameras. You feel that any brand is higher or better than others? How do you feel about all those brands? I used to be massively. Why you ask? People yeah. having the perception that if you can have this particular brand, you can get a good picture, or and a particular person is not taking getting an image because they don't have a camera. Okay. Two years ago, I would have told that a certain brand is much better than the rest. But right now, the gap is very less. So everyone is catching up. So I would say um, I have used Nikon cameras, uh, Canon. Uh, so it's all about you, how you understand the settings in the camera nowadays. So all the flagship cameras are almost at the same level right now. Hardly there is any. There could be something here and there, like in Nikon, uh, while you shoot the video, you can shoot uh, still images as well, which is not there in any other camera brands. For uh, Sony, uh, the upper hand is where the more number of frames per second, like uh, A1 has 30 versus the rest has the maximum 20 in full row, like in A93 has 120. So likewise, there are certain positives and negatives in each brand. Pre-capture from Sony in Bow Format. Sir, Nikon as well. No, pre-capture is full row. I, today I saw 
somebody uh, I mean, there was a reel of uh, C9 I think with the late, latest from Fiber, he can answer that. It's there in... Yeah, it's called out to capture. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, actually they started in their Nikon 1 onwards. That, that old, yeah, the yeah. first Nikon 1, the small cute cameras. From there onwards, the Nik yeah. Nikon had that function. Now Nikon brought the red camera. I think we did the feed there. Red is... For the video. Cinema line, cinematic line. But again, today they announced that they will not interfere in what uh, Red does. They continues to work the same way as what Red was doing for generation. So, yeah, but definitely they will adopt a lot of technology from Red for video capture. Okay. Then, thank you. So okay, all who are sitting here, you guys can reach out any time. Happy to assist, happy to help. Okay. Because you guys are my people now. Because you guys have shown uh, that courage to come down here from different parts of Dubai on a working day. So I want to give you back. So anything that I can help with in photography, I'm happy to. When are you going for next out? Uh, uh, I know, I know. I know. Thursday, Farhan uh, from LG, he want to ask something to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Actually, do you use any monitor? Currently, no. 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 Any reason? Nothing. I was considering different brands and looking at it. Uh, so when I move to a new place, I would love to get a uh, monitor. So somebody was willing to give uh, one monitor for uh, my testing. So uh, I don't know, I haven't spoken with them for some time now. Uh -huh. yeah. There is any specific uh, in the specs to I don't do video editing, uh, so predominantly photo editing. So anything that suits uh, for uh, photo, yeah, color calibration. Or if, if there is inbuilt uh, color calibration, much better. So that I don't have to put a device to calibrate. What size you prefer? Uh, 21, 22. 22. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, yes. for your amazing explanation and uh, you amazing. know we were, were no, no. <laughs> super cool super. <laughs> okay super cool explanation of uh, you know about wildlife photography uh, like birds in action frozen editing works editing workshop like workflow you know when he was talking about the 80 20 rule i was just having a thing another 10 you can reduce once you have a tour box with you <laughs> you know that? <laughs> you know, you can have a toolbox. And the other thing is, like, you know, we have some guests from LGO here. They have amazing 5K monitors. Yeah. And we will be uh, doing a lot of activities along with them as well. So, see, what happens, you know, when you see things on the monitor, uh, exactly the same thing you can just give it to those guys who are sitting behind the cube art. Uh, you know, you don't need to do any color correction. Because whatever you see on the monitor that you get on a print, the prints which you can see over there. LG monitors, LG. yeah. LG, they make amazing, uh, you know, uh, 5K monitors. Even I was not knowing, I was knowing LG used to make only the TVs as well as, uh, you know, uh, the laptop, uh, the, um, home appliances kind of stuff, you know, like a uh, small monitor I saw, LG, but uh, they make amazing screens. It's available, that's what they, yeah. yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Thank, thanks again for Thank coming, you. and be, we'll be taking a group picture. Before that, I just want to just mention, like during this iftar photo talk, we are conducting a photography contest. So, do you know? Last year, we conducted a photography contest. Like, uh, uh, 205 people registered for that, and out of that, we got 64 of them printed by Cubart, and we just uh, kept it out there. The kind of quality of the pictures, you know, one year it is still uh, staying in one year. Now, we want to just replace it with the new pictures, photographs. Okay. Now, we were talking about ethical photograph, right? At this month, same price. Okay. We were talking about the ethical in photography. Okay. Now, what we thought unethical this time. <laughs> like, shoot a picture, the theme is right in the heart. The, uh, why this theme? It is the tagline of Burjman. Uh, you can take <coughs> pictures inside Burjman Mall. For that, you need to take get a um, permission. So, you can send that uh, request to us. We will give you the permission form. Okay. People? people, you have to take the model release. Suppose if people is involved, you have to take the model release from them so that you know you won't be getting in trouble. Now, either inside the mall or outside this community, because Burjaman is in the middle of Bar Dubai, so somewhere in Bar Dubai, create, keeping the subject as right in the heart, take a picture and send it to us before 30th of April. Post those pictures on Instagram, tag iBrand Connect, tag Burjuman Mall and hashtag Iftar Photo Talk 2024. Now, only one picture per person, and you can do any kind of manipulation on the picture. Anything. You can use AI, you can use, uh, yeah, use it. And we want to see that creativeness in you. Because no one should say that, oh, this is an ethical picture. There should not be any kind of correction or anything. Yes, we are creating in a different way. Because you know, everyone is using AI these days. Use Adobe Photo, uh, any, any image editing software, stop pass or any, anything else. Creative. But at the end, when you send this picture to us, we want to see the original JPG or RAW picture as well. So you, sh you should send two pictures, one as the original capture either in an JPG or a row and the other one as the corrected pictures. And of course, we are going to um, you know, do the kind of judging on the corrected pictures only. And the first prize winner, the first prize winner <coughs> gets 10,000 dirhams, uh, second prize winner gets 5,000 dirhams and the third prize winner gets 2,000 dirhams. And 64 of you get a chance to get your pictures printed, framed, kept in this place for almost one year. That's going to be amazing, right? Okay, so please participate. Hmm? Super cool. <laughs> so please participate that. And uh, we'll be taking a small clips of different languages like after the, uh, the you know, group picture. So please come forward. Thank you very much for coming and you know, we are here another um, five more days. 31st is the last day. So tomorrow is going to be Arzo. She is going to do, uh, you know, uh, normally like everyone used to think about like studio flash is required to get the portrait pictures, right? So it's, it's a game changer. The continuous light is a game changer these days. If you have three of these or even more of this, you can create amazing portraits with this. Okay, so she's going to talk about that tomorrow. And uh, to, uh, day after tomorrow, that is, tomorrow is 27, 28, uh, Alkas Mia, he is, uh, is Yusuf, he is uh, an amazing astrophotographer. So the place where he lives, there is no light pollution. So it is an amazing chance for all of us to meet this gentleman and he always tell, please come to our place. There is no light pollution in, 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 in his village. Which part is? It's somewhere near to Alain, Alain okay. say, yeah. Okay, so he's going to talk about, he used to um, teach uh, astrophotography in New York University, Abu Dhabi, and he is a member of Astro uh, uh, Society. Uh, it is on um, the day after tomorrow, 28th. 29th, three uh, wildlife photographers are going to have a kind of session uh, related to wildlife as well as birds. Uh, that is Hans, Vinod and uh, Cheryl. So all the three are going to be here. And that is sponsored by Canon. And 30th, uh, uh, who is 30th? No, Miro. Miro Manino. So he's, he's again a software engineer uh, working uh, in New York University of 
uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, he is into landscape photo shoot and uh, he's talking about Tamron lenses uh, along, you know, the, the, the kind of ta Tamron lenses can be used on social media. What are the kind of connection of this kind of, because they are very lightweight lenses. Tamron, they make amazing lenses, lightweight lenses. 35 is, is Subodh Shetty. So we all know Subodh, right? Uh, during, uh, he was um, focusing more towards the street initially, then portrait, and then now he is focusing to many genres of photography. So he's talking about photography A to Z. So that is the last day we are just going to, you know, make our 20 days of marathon to an end. So please register and join along with us. Also follow us. Uh, is, is, is there someone who didn't scan that uh, particular uh, QR code? Uh, the one everyone scanned, right? Okay, so you get your pictures like the one which you we showed uh, during the uh, event. You get all those pictures. You can share those pictures. Uh, and again, thank you very much, Anup. Thank and you. thanks for all your support. Thank you. Thank thanks you. everyone for supporting iBrand Connect and keep support. Keep by a lot of uh, tripods from me, gimbals from me. <laughs> uh, you are hearing yeah? <laughs> filters from me. <laughs> Many things. Anything related to photography, for example. Your one-stop destination partner for content creation. Like, if you want to create a podcast studio at your home, we are there with you. If you want to create a studio at your home, we are there for you. And if you want to create, for example, a, a proper workstation uh, with all sort of, you know, sophisticated equipment to create your... Yes, yes, yes. And whatever the requirements is done by... Yes. You can call us, just we come there, we do the estimation, so, uh, like, uh, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Nothing. You just need to uh, call us. <laughs> we will do the, you know, like, <laughs> no, as you guys go, as, as you guys go for uh, location scouting, we come to your location to scout. <laughs> In your home, you are doing your uh, yourself, right? Okay. Now, that is another great thing. We, iBrand I brand Connect is a signature channel partner for Shams, Shaja Media City. Our company is under Shams, Shaja Media City. And as I do uh, consultancy, so we got uh, something called Signature Channel Partner Consultant Service. So if you want to create your own business, you can always approach me. Okay, so a media license is only 5,750 dirhams a year. That's it. You get three activities. Like you can have photo shoot, you can have video shoot. If you want to create e-commerce, also possible. As long as you have a uh, visa, you don't need to uh, do a visa there. Yeah, that's okay. That's Perfect. Right. But you know, don't be For the French. Up, uh, no need. Studio in New York. No problem. That is your home studio. All right. You can always call me, WhatsApp to me. And because now I just went through all these ah, hassles. So I know exactly what are the procedures, like, you know, how to create the VAT certification, how to create the corporate tax session, and uh, all, all these sort of, um, you know, things that, you know. So I support the people. Like, under me, right now, there are 30 companies. So we, we are only four years so far. So uh, we got under us, I brand connect, we got 30 companies. So one of the companies, right now, one of the companies is doing an iftar um, event, uh, you know, in uh, Palazzo Versace. So it is good, like, you know, for example, it is not under me. It is under Shams only, but I supported them. So what happens, you know, it's a mutual. Like if there is any work or something comes in, for example, you are doing a product photo shoot uh, area, right? Many calls I get saying that, okay, can we have something related to Amazon? We want to uh, take 100 pictures, 1,000 pictures. I can connect them to you. That is I brand connect. Okay, so please come forward. Let us take a group picture and then then we will have some little bit of talk with some people. <laughs>